Hi, it's me Flo. I used to have a 10 by 5 meter above ground pool from Intex that I was really happy with. But last year you didn't see a post from me because I decided to sell it. I realized it was time to consider a more permanent solution. So this year we are building an in-ground fiberglass pool and you are going to be a part of the whole journey from start to finish. But first we have to check our local regulations and for our case any pool that has a duration longer than two months must apply for a permit through the municipality. Since we applied for a pre-built fiberglass pool, we were allowed to apply on behalf of ourselves as a property owner rather than going through a responsible contractor as would be the case for a more complex job. We checked all infrastructure around the property and found an area that would satisfy the distance requirement from the road while still looking good. We then had to request a flood map for the area because the municipality required this documentation ensuring that the project would not create future problems. We ensured that the foundation would be stable before continuing to fill out all of the paperwork for the actual application as well as creating a small document explaining how the pool would be installed following best pools instructions as shown on the screen. We submitted the application in September last year and we were given the approval in early January. Before digging the hole with the excavator he spray painted the measurements and added a few directional sticks. Then we were all set for the work to begin. He spent a few hours Hours digging through the first layer because the soil was frozen. Once it got deeper, the process speeded up until we met our biggest fear. Oh, what's that? Hard Rock Mountain. We tried to use a hydraulic brake hammer to the excavator, but it was too much and too hard rock for the excavator, so we had to use explosives instead. So that's when we rented a drilling rig. And usually when you hit these kinds of rocks, the cost of your entire project increases significantly. But what made us nervous was the fact that they were going to blow up close to our old house. That's why the method they used was to drill many small holes next to each other to minimize the impact. They spent the entire two days working on removing the stubborn rocks and luckily there were no side effects from the explosions. Step number three. Once you have dug the size of the hole, you will now need to create a foundation. First, he measured the height in order to know how much and where to add the rough rubble stones. Then he compressed it. He repeated the process until the ground was level. He then added the fine gravel as fill and compressed it again. Then he built the frame where the pool is going to be. Measuring in between is key to make it as exact as possible. The white tarpon looking fabric is added to separate the masses from each other. Because we're going to add concrete, reinforcement bars is a necessity. Step number four. Now it is time to add the concrete. Make sure to water the foundation before pouring. Save yourself time and effort and money by letting a concrete truck do the job for you. We got the B30 concrete with additional flow because it is easier to work with. The higher the number, the stronger it is. We added 20 centimeters of concrete, resulting in six cubic meters in total. To prevent air pockets, the air must be released from beneath by gently vibrating followed by leveling and smoothing it over. Remember to keep the concrete wet to avoid cracking. We then added XPS plates for isolation. This will keep the heat from evaporating and save some dollars on the electricity bill. <laughs> We chose Dominicana 820 by 370 meters from Best Pools because that was the only pool that had the widest width to its length. And Best Pools is the biggest European fiberglass pool supplier and they're also the cheaper option compared to their competitors because they produce their own pools which are also slightly thinner but as long as you make a good foundation it doesn't really matter. To unload the pool, we had to rent a crane truck. In fact, the largest crane truck because it needed to be lifted above the old phone cables in order to reach the foundation. They spent a good hour preparing and securing the pool, which is the one standing upright, before tilting it over and then pulling it up in the air. By the way, look how small I am compared to the pool. As I just mentioned, the pool got lifted approximately 
23 feet into the air before landing at its final destination. Along with the pool, we also received a tech box storing everything we would need for the pool to be up and running. We did a quick unboxing upon arrival and I will show you how to install the parts. When installing the parts, we will apply Tech 7 or any other brand that has combined glue and joint compound to make sure that it's tight and water resistant. The nozzles is pushed through the cutout circle and from the outside you'll add a rubber gasket and tighten it up. This is how it will look when the nozzles are done. Installing the LED lights is also simple. Push through the lightning cable, add Tech 7 to the cutout circles and to the attachment plate. Gently press it to the wall and use a screwdriver to attach the light. Finish it up by connecting an extension cable. For both counter current and skimmers, we had to peel off some of the isolations in order to start assembling the parts. Tech 7 is added once again to both sides of the pool, followed by a layer of rubber gasket and then tightening the parts with a screwdriver. And repeat the same order for the skimmers. Some people would argue that it's enough with a rubber gasket, but we want to minimize the risk of water leakage, so we are not shy on the Tech 7. But make sure to avoid spilling and clean up right after any overflow and accidents. Normally, it will be enough with one skimmer, but we custom order two skimmers for two reasons. It will look more aesthetically pleasing to have one on each side of the counter current and the flow will be more consistent and you have the possibility to upgrade to a more powerful pump in the future. We decided to support the stairs, the sitting areas and everything else that wouldn't have support from concrete with XPS plates. Usually you would have to build a column of brick as support but since we had some leftovers and it would be cut out and designed exactly to the measurements of the pool, we went with our creativity and used the plates instead. Step number 6. Now it is time to fill in the gaps surrounding the pool. Because of the high amount of pressure from the mass itself, there is a specific method to make sure the walls don't bend inwards. And the the way you do it is to add 30 centimeters of water while adding 30 centimeters of drainage mass. Repeat the process until the pool has reached its maximum. This is going to take some time but we are not taking any risk. If you want to make a stronger and more secure foundation without much effort, you can add B20 dry concrete as a frame around the pool. I think we added every second or third layer. We used around 18 bags of 25 kilo concrete on each side and 8 bags on the shorter side. In total, we added four layers with around 200 bags, if I remember correctly. It sounds like a nightmare, but you got enough time to relax in between the work, so it's definitely worth it in the end. Before closing up the gap completely, we lowered the tech box into the ground and started constructing the pipe system. We are using flexi pipes in the ground, and the reason why we went for flexi instead of rigid pipes is because flexi is more suitable for our environment. We live in Norway where there aren't termites in the soil, and because we have extremely cold winters we needed pipes which could handle the frost rigid pipes looking like these these are stronger to pressure it is resistant to termites and it takes longer to build ideally we would have chosen this all over the places but we are using these in the tech box instead. The blue Griffin glue is elastic and most suitable for flex pipes, while the yellow Griffin glue is stronger and does not allow any movement, which makes it perfect for rigid pipes. When assembling the pipes, we first clean the area where the glue is put on, then the glue is added, followed by tightening the parts together. It is pretty straightforward. To add further isolation, we also got isolation for the pipes just so the energy is as effective as it could be. While we had the chance, we decided to make two more separate pipes, one for emptying the water and one for backwashing. After constructing the road of pipes, we buried it in with some more gravel. We then covered the whole surroundings with woven landscape fabric and added more rough gravel stone and some finer gravel and once again compressed it. This routine is getting all too familiar now. Step number seven. It is time to figure out how you'd like the pool to go with everything else in your yard. We went for a frame of tiles surrounded by composite decking. We started by building a formwork for the tiles we picked out. When casting the concrete around the edges, we used the same type of concrete as the one we used while closing up the gap, but only this time we mixed the B20 with water. This was by far the most exhausting job due to the heavy pushing through the mixer. Once it was stirred, we applied the concrete within the formwork, but leave some room for the cement at the top. Make sure to level it out and keep water it once it dries up. Let it solidify for about a week. 
It is common practice to wait a year before attaching the tiles just in case the ground moves, resulting in cracks in your new tiles. After consulting with the construction engineer, we decided to attach the tiles this year after all. The day before attaching the tiles, we made sure to prime each piece. Don't worry if you spill to the visible side, it is easy to peel off. And don't forget to soak the concrete with primer as well. And just like that, the tiles got cut out and designed to the frame of the pool. If you look closely you can see that it angles slightly upwards when it's getting closer to the water this is done purposely for drainage the decking is a hundred percentage composite which contains no organic material that can be affected by the pool water or sun exposure when choosing a decking around a swimming pool this is something to keep in mind you also need to use hydrochloric acid screws if your pool has salt water to avoid rust when building a decking half of the job is making sure the foundation is level then we place the joints 30 centimeters apart and when choosing the pattern for the decking we decided to use the leftover cuts as a starter at the opposite side to create a variation and to leave little to no waste. For the built-in tech box we decided to make that part of the decking removable by building a frame underneath followed by joints in the opposite direction. We spent about three full days building the entire 70 square meters decking. For pool coverage we bought polycarbonate slats directly from a Chinese factory. The automated covering system with rigid slats ensures safety for objects up to 100 kilos per square meter. Yes, that means I can safely walk on the cover. The benefits of choosing polycarbonate slats over PVC slats is that it's more resistant to high temperatures, it has a higher impact strength, no discoloration, and achieves longer service life. When installing the slats, you'll discover that one end is marked as A, another end is marked as B. Both ends have their own clips. The same letter has to be on the same side. Now you'll connect one slat to the beginning slat by sliding it on. Use the clips to lock it into place. Repeat the process until all slats are connected. When ordering slats, it requires you to give exact measurements of your pool, including length, width at multiple locations, as well as angles to ensure that the slats will fill up the entire pool and no width is wider than the shortest distance. You can further customize slats with isolation foam, but since we were looking for transparent option and isolation was sufficient for our use, we didn't see the point in increasing our budget. And if the rolling kit is installed above the pool, you'll need to protect the slats from the heat. If not, you will risk deforming the slats. We sold it by building a protective box that we can also use as a bench or for decoration, or in this case, a built-in waterfall. Now, all that's left is a few final touches like laying grass, decorating with some white marble stones, and not to forget installing an outdoor shower. The pool automation starts with the remote display for our Sugar Valley Aquazenic that is the hard for all automation and control. The remote display allows for management of everything related to the aquazenic water treatment such as pH levels, redox, salinity and more, while also allowing for external auxiliary connections to pool lights, pool cover, UVC, heat pump, pump flow and much more. The water treatment starts with the skimmers where floating debris from the surface is pulled into the skimmer basket and water flows past and continues into the technical room. Since we have one skimmer on each side we have equipped one PVC ball valve for each skimmer allowing us to close one or both skimmers for performing repairs. The next step is the pump equipped with its own rough filter quite similar to the skimmer basket and it's a security measure to ensure no larger debris can proceed into the pump and damage it. We also purchased Aquagem Saver, a frequency inverter that lets us change the speed of the pump to lower energy costs and to reduce stress on the pump. The saver is then connected to the Aquacenic for full control of the flow speed depending on parameters such as if the pool cover is on, the water needs treatments and so on. The water then goes into the pump responsible for the actual water circulation of the system before the water gets pumped into a copper and silver anode ionization chamber. The chamber makes use of technology often seen in hospital, initially developed developed by NASA for water purification in space and makes use of silver and copper ion producing reactions to neutralize bacteria such as E. coli, Legionella and Bacillus bacteria. It also helps folliculate small debris to larger parts that can be more easily picked up in the next step, the sand filter. 
At the top of the SAM filter, we have a six-way valve enabling different actions such as recircling water, filtering, backwashing, and more. Based on the selection, the water will either be proceed out of the drain port or back into the system. If the waste or rinse mode is selected, the water will go through the drain port to either lead the water out into a stormwater foam 30 meters away or into a spare flex pipe that can also be extended. If we choose a mode such as recirculating or filtering, the water continues out to the bypass valve which lets us adjust the flow to any of the pipes or fully close some of the circuits to have greater control of the flow rate. In this case, the valve that continues into the system is closed, meaning that the water must continue past the open valve at the right. The water then goes past a flow sensor for our Electroengineering Heat Smart Plus, responsible for turning on and off our air to water heat pump. While the heat pump could maintain a set temperature, the Heat Smart enables remote control for smart home systems and was also a requirement for our planned upgrade to the Electroengineering Titanium G2 heat exchanger, a way to utilize our existing geothermal heating system used for the house. After the flow sensor, the water continues past the temperature sensor also used by the heat smart before going out of the technical room through isolated flex pipes and into our best pool's 14 kilowatt air to water heat pump. The heat pump is strategically placed in front of the exhaust valves from our server room so all of the excess heat from the servers can be reused to heat the pool. This significantly increases our COP, also known as coefficient of performance value, a value measuring how effective it performs. The COP on this pump is 5.8, meaning that the ideal conditions is around 23 degrees Celsius. Our heat output with 2.4 kilowatt of electricity would be equivalent of 14 kilowatt of electric heating. This is possible since air to water heat pumps extract heat from the air instead of heating up the water manually, and this is the reason why they are so energy efficient. However, the colder the surrounding areas, the less heat can be extracted and the COP value decreases as well as the efficiency of the pump. When the water has returned from the heat pump, it goes back into the technical room and into a bypass valve with a red handle indicating that it's now hot water. From there, the water goes into Filtreo Titanium 80W UVC lamp. UVC rays have the highest energy in the UV spectrum and are therefore often used as treating drinking water. The high level of UVC radiation neutralizes almost all kinds of bacteria, viruses, and even fungi, providing clear and clean water. While probably a bit overkill in combination with our existing system, the UVC complements the hydrolysis, electrolysis, and ionization from the aquasonic well and ensures redundancy and helps offload some of the work. The water then continues onto multiple measuring devices that are a part of the aquasonic system, starting with a temperature probe underneath with a blue pH probe and a red redox probe on top. It continues with a gray probe for salinity, measuring the conductivity in the water, and then the mechanical flow meter that ensures the hydrolysis is only turned on when there is movement of water. The next step is the hydrolysis and the electrolysis cell where an electric current is added to break down the water molecule and in return produces active agents such as oxygen, hydrogen peroxide, hydroxide, and ozone. The cell also supports low salinity electrolysis where one to two grams of salt can be added to the pool water and the cell transforms the salt into residual and natural chlorine for added benefits without the side effects from traditional chlorine. At the end of the cell, there is a dosing pump to dose pH minus if the unit wants to lower the pH values of the pool. We have consumed very little pH minus this season, and it's the only chemical needed unlike most other systems, and makes the entire process of owning and maintaining the pool 100% automated. After the water is treated, it is split into right and left side, where the right side goes to the discharge nozzles, and the left side goes to the waterfalls integrated into the pool cover bench. Besides the entire system we just talked about, there is a smaller circuit dedicated for the water jet, also known as the counter current. When triggered by a mnemonic button from the inside of the pool, the power of the jet pump is turned on and water is sucked in from the bottom pipe into the jet pump before being pushed out and back into the pool through the upper pipe. But what happens with the debris that did not end up in the skimmer? For this, we have an 8-stream 7310 robot vacuumer that is controlled by the control box. The robot sucks up debris from the bottom of the pool as well as the walls and even brushes the water line. The only part not covered from the technical box is the control box for the automatic polycarbonate slack cover. The box is wired to a motor inside of the legs of the roller and can be either controlled through the box by remote control or by auxiliary relay on the Aquasenic. What we have here is an automated system which makes owning a pool easy and stress-free. If this video got you a little closer to getting your own pool, make sure to leave your questions below and good luck, it is worth it.